We are here in Betty Wyckoff's backyard uh, amidst all of these beautiful flowers that she has tended to uh, throughout her life here in Hopkinton. And we are now about to go on the back porch and talk a little bit about Betty and the gardening that she does and also about the care that she provides for her father now nearly 104 years old who's living in her home. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Come and join us. Hi Betty, thank you so much for having me here at your lovely home and outdoors today in July in your beautiful garden surroundings here. It's, it, it truly is a bit of what heaven could be on earth, I think. <laughs> it's just beautiful all around here. And I know in our short time together, there are so many different things we could talk about, knowing you, who you are, what you do in the community. But today for our time, uh, what we decided um, that we would focus on two areas of uh, what you uh, spend your time and your passion on in um, taking care and uh, making its most beautiful of life for uh, both your garden and the years of your father. And your father, Sterling, um, is now in his year of 103, is yes. that right? He'll yes, he'll be 104 in December. Oh my goodness, wow. And I believe he is now the oldest yes. resident, resident in Hopkinton. And um, so why don't we just uh, dive in right there okay. and talk about um, the situation where he's living at home uh, with you for uh, how many years he's now? He's been here 10 years. He's been with you 10 years, yes. And uh, that's quite, quite a bit of time. I know you've seen and lived with Sterling at different phases of the end years of his life. Yes. and gone through a lot together. And I'm wondering uh, if you could tell your, the viewers here today a little bit about how, what brought you to the decision of your dad living with you, um, why that uh, is important, what inspired that commitment um, and uh, move. The commitment started way back when I used to perform in nursing homes. I had a fiddle band and we went all over the place so I saw lots and lots of nursing homes. Um, where I could wander around unannounced and really see how what was what was happening in the nursing homes, and what I saw was um, that it was always extremely stifling hot or airless. You couldn't open windows. Uh, the food was n didn't look good at all. A lot of the food was mostly deli meats and a lot of that kind of thing. Um, the people were some of them. It's okay, I guess, with some people that are just talking out all the time, but then there were people who were really still aware of things and it was annoying to them. Mm -hmm. And there was very little privacy, and it, there were very few things people could own in their room. They mostly kept it like a hospital, so they mm -hmm. couldn't have, you know, maybe special tapes and records and or whatever they wanted to listen to. And so all the cultural background and all the things they were used to, or special desserts, or anything like that was taken away. Mm. Uh, plus they're putting in, put them in a place where they're not near family, and they're not near neighbors, and they're not near friends that they knew in the town they were in. Mm -hmm. so, so that was your overall observation? That was my overall observation. Mm -hmm. I didn't found that they didn't father. speak a lot, a lot of them did not speak English, and a lot of them didn't seem to be very happy with the job. Mm. They weren't laughing and fooling with them. They weren't being silly with them and hugging them. They were mostly just commuting them from place to place to keep them safe. Yeah. You know, some of them had better training than others. I saw some things that obviously were not very well trained, but mm -hmm. that's just another thing. Yeah, so then uh, is that the point where you decided or talked with your dad? Um, I had always told them way back that they would never go to a nursing home. Mm -hmm. if, it w if I had my way, no matter what, they would never be sent to a nursing home. Both parents? Both parents. I had my mother also and she passed away at 89. Mm -hmm. So she was here a while and uh, she had very good health until just near the end. So she was only ill for about 12 days. Mm -hmm. So we were devastated that she actually left as soon as she did because she was in such good health. The day before she 
got sick, she was helping me prune my blueberry bushes. Wow. So that does let you know how how active she was right yeah. up to the end. But in um, a good place in her last few days. Yes, yes, short. she loved living here. Yeah. This was a where they lived was very nice, but it was a cape, and they had to go down dangerous cellar stairs to the laundry. And you know there was, there's an upstairs they were trying to get to, and stairs were getting to be difficult for them, and so that was an issue. Mm -hmm. And um, my dad couldn't drive anymore. When he got to be 90, he decided he should start not thinking about driving anymore. He was afraid his attention wouldn't be as good. So once they can't drive and get themselves around, and um, it was good to have them live here because I could take them anywhere they wanted to go. Mm -hmm. So what did that uh, move and transition uh, mean for both you and your dad in coming to live together? You know, it was the easiest transition in the world because of the way the house is set up. Mm -hmm. So they had their own quarters, they had um, their own bedroom, we set, set up the bathrooms, so we cut through the wall so they could go directly right to the bathroom, and uh, it's all on one floor, and um, very easy access to the big kitchen. And um, my father loved a wood stove, so we put a wood stove in. And we did things like that. We put a gas fireplace in their mm -hmm. compartment or apartment section, and they liked that. And then they had all these wraparound porches with the gazebos, and it, it was very easy for them to get around. Mm -hmm. um, Which is important. They, yeah, because they're going to get more frail, and that's mm -hmm. a concern. I think the biggest concern you have with elderly is them falling. And a lot of my friends that are my age have decided to have their parents go into nursing homes because they think it's for safety. Mm -hmm. They're so afraid of their parents falling, and that is a worry. Mm -hmm. and, and some parents are better at it than others. Mm -hmm. My parents are very good about being careful mm -hmm. and realizing that they may lose their balance. But some people fall a lot, and then it's a problem. Uh -huh. So do you think that was uh, education or communication with your parents, or they just... They just were more aware of their frailties. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's funny because my father did fall like three times, mm -hmm. badly, mm -hmm. and he didn't even hurt himself. Mm. Wow. Once was falling down a whole thing of stairs uh -huh. <laughs> at well, a friend's uh, house. Very fortunate. <laughs> wow. But, but uh, that never happens usually. Uh -huh. You know, most people get into real trouble when they fall. Hmm. What would you say have been the challenges as well as the, as the benefits in um, your dad moving in with you over time, these 10 years? Uh, the challenges are many. One is you have to witness them going downhill. Yeah. And, and you know, you feel bad for them mm -hmm. and you hate to see them suffer. You sit there and you see them suffer and there's not much you can do. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so sad. That's the very sad part. Um, so they what also would you advise um, in that case uh, well, in dealing with the sadness and helping your father go through these changes? I went, I went and saw a psychologist, mm -hmm. yes. actually, to, get um, some support. to help me um, know how to cope mm -hmm. and how to deal with things. Mm -hmm. And also I learned through trial and error. Yes. I found um, it's very important not to disagree with them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, because there's no point to it. Mm -hmm. You know, I... It, you know, they're not in a position where they can make a lot of decisions. Mm -hmm. And if they want you to change something, you can agree and say, yeah, we'll work on that. Maybe we could do that. Um, so or even if it's something wrong, like they remember something completely different than you know what happened. Yeah. You just say, yeah, I, I guess that was the way it went. Mm -hmm. Because when you argue with them and you might even get frustrated or angry, they get very hurt. They're very sensitive. Uh, at that age because they have so much time to focus on the little mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very patient and you have to always put a happy face on. I wouldn't talk about difficult bills or your health problems. You know, talk about your health problems. Mm -hmm. They like to talk about the health problems because that's a real important thing for them. A big part of their life. Yes, it is. Yeah. That's why it's nice to have other people come in because mm -hmm. then they can repeat it to someone else. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, someone else is willing to listen and, and you know, give them sympathy and um, some encouragement. In a way, it's their work in later life to watch out for their health, right? To Absolutely. Pay attention to it's a natural changes. focus. Yeah. It's a natural focus. Yeah. Even my, my 50th uh, class reunion, we were laughing about the fact that we're already now talking about our health more than anything else. Mm -hmm. More than successes or grandchildren or anything else is how's our health? Mm -hmm. 
So it does happen. And we all slowly get that way if, if we get yeah. blessed with more time. Yeah, and of course you have to eventually, as they get older and more frail, you may be required to do things that you're very inept at, or you have very little uh, training. Mm -hmm. uh, I've you never had any care nursing training. Um, I'm not the kind of person who likes to talk about body functions. Okay. <laughs> so that was extremely hard for me, putting on plastic gloves and mm -hmm. doing things that only nurses do, and it was getting harder and harder for me. And my dad, um, when he got really sick and was in the hospital this spring, um, they finally decided to put him under hospice. And once hospice uh, came into the picture, I got they, they gave me a lady that comes four days a week, mm -hmm. and she does all the nursing care. And then I have an RN that comes in once a week and does all his vitals because he gets worried about, oh, what about this? Do you yeah, think that? Sure. And I can't, I say, Dad, I'm not a nurse, I don't mm -hmm. know. And he's not well enough to travel to a doctor. Mm -hmm. So to have the nurse come in and check his lungs and check his, his oxygen level and all that, that absolutely gives him, you know, uh, a relief of worry. Right, right. And mm -hmm. also they all give him lots of attention. Mm -hmm. And I know when the nurse comes in, I can lay down and take a nap. Mm -hmm. Because the, the downside also is that you will get very tired. When you start mm. to work, work with someone that has to be taken care of 24-7, um, it is, it is tiring yeah. and you can't go anywhere. Yes, right. You know, this so you, is more of a community approach and bringing in other people to help you out. And absolutely. So been you a, can do the best job I highly can. recommend if, you're, if you have a parent yeah. that's that ill, yeah. hospice is, is the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and they're very, point. very professional. Mm -hmm. You know? How about the benefits? What would you say? Terrific benefits. Um, m of course, I loved having my mother here. I was very close to my mother, and she knew all the best cooking and everything, so it was great. Mm -hmm. She was an expert in a lot of areas that I never had a chance to learn from her because we were always so busy. Mm -hmm. um, so it was nice. I could take her on walks and pick flowers, and um, all of my grandchildren and, and a lot of the relatives loved my mother would come and bring her things. It was very nice. My father, um, when, my, when my mother passed away, they'd been married 71 years. Wow. And so my father was absolutely devastated. He wanted to jump in the casket with my mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was devastated, my, we all were. Um, but with him, he was terribly lonely. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I got him involved with the senior center mm -hmm. and playing Scrabble with the seniors. And you met a lot of people not his age, maybe 10 or 12 years, 15 years younger, but uh -huh. to him that was close as he could get. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so he made friends that way. And he did I was wheelchair bingo, I mean uh, volleyball. Wheelchair volleyball, yeah. and he was so good at it. Uh -huh. I finally asked him, I said, Dad, how come you're so good at that? You're really unbelievable. I said, did you play tennis or something? Oh yeah, I did. I said, what do you mean you did? Yeah, all through high school. I said, how come I never knew that? Come to find out there was a very wealthy kid next door to him growing up. He was an only child and they had a tennis court. Mm -hmm. So they always had my father play tennis with this kid. Mm -hmm. And I never knew it. And this is the kind of things I found out over the years. So you get his stories. Oh, incredible. He remembers Lindbergh mm -hmm. and remembers when there were no airplanes at all. And in 1917, when because we had the marathoners come here, uh, marathon morning. Uh -huh. And so we got talking about the marathon, and he said, yeah, I, I saw the marathon in 1917 on Commonwealth Avenue. Wow. And, you know, you can imagine, there were probably only 15 people that yeah. went by, wow. <laughs> but that, that long ago. Uh -huh. um, so anything you talk about is fascinating because of the fact that when he was younger, we didn't have time to ask him all these questions. He was busy working two jobs and putting five children through college. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we just all had to work and be very busy. But now he was home, he had to be more sedate, and he had time to really relax. Mm -hmm. And he was more apt to tell me funny stories. And we've gone, gone through a lot of incredible experiences he had. Mm. Incredible. Incredible difficult deal. things he had to go through. During you know? the depression. The depression was bad. He was in college, and he was at Northeastern with a, a study and work program. And um, when it came time to work, they said, I'm sorry, we can't give you the job because so many men are out of work with families, they're getting the job, so you're out of school. And so we had to quit school. He had no money to continue. Later on, he ended up teaching at Northeastern, but it was through different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but he said uh, he worked at Telecron, and he only got a ride to work. And sometimes he worked into the night. 
And so then you have to walk all the way back from Talacorn to home on Claflin Avenue in the dark, two o'clock in the morning. Wow. Snow, sleet, rain, you know. He says if he could get home before light, he could go to sleep. If he get home and it started to be light, he couldn't get to sleep. Mm, that gives you a new way of understanding and learning from your father while he's here telling you the stories from his life. Oh, it's incredible. It gives you history right, right in front of you. Like he said, uh, in 1939, they had a Christmas party for all the people at Telecron. And they were all waiting for the bus to go home. And he took a good look at them. And they all had rags on, basically. He said they all had, this was supposed to be their best clothes they had. And they were all very worn. Everybody was in the same boat. Yeah. So. Wow. So, so it sounds like you have learned from him, and you have uh, you listen to him share perspectives yeah. together Absolutely. in your time at home. Mm -hmm. And here you are, and he's almost 104 now yes. at your home. Time has changed, and. Uh, Sterling is dealing with more physical challenges as he ages yes. at this point. Yes, he's blind and he can hardly hear now. Yeah. And he's very frail, but he still gets around in a, in a um, what do you call that? Uh, the walker? <laughs> walker. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> gets right. around in a walker. Mm -hmm. And he does pretty well. He answered the he door. He does. Today. He does yeah. very well. And mentally, you can ask him any question, and he still helps you with engineering problems. Uh, uh -huh. Construction problems. He built his own houses. Uh -huh. He built his own boat. You know, they, I never saw a workman in the house. They did everything themselves. Uh -huh. And so, anything I have that's a problem here, he knows exactly what to do. Uh huh. So he's a resource. He is a terrific stories. resource. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what would you advise uh, other people who are considering on in taking this on um, to? how to go through these different changes over time and as physical abilities uh, weaken. Um, what, what keeps you both resilient in, at home instead of a nursing home situation uh, or something it, else? One of the most important things is to keep your elderly parent engaged with the world, ah, yeah. with relatives, mm -hmm. old mm -hmm. friends. Now, you may not have a parent that connects with them because of their inability to use the telephone or write anymore mm -hmm. but I will call friends and say would you like to call my dad sometime mm -hmm. he'd love to talk to you mm -hmm. uh, I write letters to people I, I uh, take a picture of my dad on my iPad and I run it right through my my uh, copier mm -hmm. and I write a little letter so if they get a recent picture of him okay. with a little letter mm -hmm. dad said hello mm -hmm. I asked dad what would you like to tell that person mm -hmm. So you and write the letters for yeah, them. Yeah, you have way. to be you have to be the person that connects them. Mm -hmm. And once they connect, I mean, once the person calls, he's so happy to hear yeah. from them. And then the other see the other person doesn't know whether they should call him because maybe he's too sick or maybe he's right, sleeping. Right. Maybe I'll disturb him. Yeah. My father's the same way. I shouldn't call him now. They might be ready to have their dinner. Uh, yeah. It is so th that generation is so polite mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it makes it hard mm -hmm. because I you know. Sometimes. If it's eight thirty, oh, it might be too late to call. You know, yeah. things like that. So sometimes we all wait too long and right. too late, and right. don't have that chance for That's connection. That's right. So it sounds like you certainly are enabling. That, that helps as the person taking care of them. That should be your job. Is one of your jobs is to do that. They need to have a social life of people their age mm -hmm. or close to their age. I can be company to my dad all day long, but it's just me. Mm -hmm. He, he definitely needs, just like other people, like to hang around with their friends that are their age sometimes. Mm -hmm. They don't always want to be with little kids, and they mm -hmm. don't always be with old people. They want to sometimes be with their own generation. Mm -hmm. Why should it be any different from my dad? Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Especially women. It's a funny story. He's got two nurses now, and one of them is older. And he asks the older nurse, how old are you? And she says, well, I'm a little older than, I'm older than your daughter. And he says, well, how much older? Because he can't see anymore, and he wants to know how, what this person looks like. And she wouldn't tell him. And then um, he said, well, I'll tell you, that nurse Bridget, he said, I could run away with that girl. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so he loves to talk to women. Uh -huh. And yeah. it's, uh, it's just something he's always enjoyed. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very innocent and nice. It's just he likes to compliment them. And he likes to tell them how much he appreciates them, and I think they love to come here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Works okay. both ways. Perhaps that's a different perspective than his own as a male that he gets to compare notes with on life. Uh huh. <laughs>
too. Also, so yeah. In addition to maybe running away with her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll think an older person can't have fantasies. They do. That's right. That's and they right. have and nightmares. They have yeah. all the same things we do. Yeah. Uh, we think that when because they're old and it, it's slow, some people get impatient. They even yell at them, and things like that. And it's it's not necessary. Mm-hmm. Well. Uh, this has been very interesting uh, to have a little bit of a, a microscope to learn and listen about uh, how you are living together and it sounds like you're doing a beautiful job and something is going very well. Your dad again is almost 104. Yes, he just recovered from severe pneumonia where they didn't oh, think he was going to live. Goodness, wow. And he suffered but he came home mm -hmm. and he wanted to come home from the hospital early and I said okay, mm -hmm. that was a deal. and. Um, so we came home and he suffered, and I had to be the nurse. And mm -hmm. but we managed to get through it, and he's all completely recovered. Wow, wow that's quite 100%. remarkable. One hundred percent. So I don't know, maybe it's something in the water or the soil. Genetics, I think. Genetics, okay. But uh, likewise for your garden, I want to spend a little bit yes. of time talking about your gardens here, because they are certainly flourishing and just beautiful in the surroundings here. You gave me a tour uh, earlier so that I could see. You have a place that, uh, of shade with different plants um, there that are really thriving. A place for sun and beautiful colors put together mm -hmm. uh, where you combine the white of daisy uh, with bright colors um, from your tiger lilies. And uh, I see uh, purple flowers. I think I saw a <laughs> bluebird also uh, appreciating uh, the area right there. You showed me you have blueberries and raspberries here that are well cared for trying to prevent little uh, creatures from getting in and and you have an abundant harvest it looks yes. like my brother thought i was mean to 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 put netting over me he says i should let the birds eat them oh but wow. i said well, I, I, I may eventually okay. but i i want to at least be successful one year yeah. and see the results well i think you have a little of both you, you yes did leave a bush I did for leave the some. birds yes i did uh, and you have some for yourselves yes. and i sample some and they're, they're Wonderful, and <laughs> and there's also a victory garden. Yes, um, there is on your property. You yes. said that your brother. Yes, uh, he takes starts care all the plants upstairs, and then as we need him, he puts wow. them in, uh -huh. and he puts them in very strict rows. Okay, they and you're eating from oh that already garden yes, and your we already have plenty to eat. Yes. All of you here. Yep, I'm and on a diet right now of yellow string beans, uh, lots of lettuce. And um, something else he grows, and eggs, because from the chickens. Oh, that's right. There are chickens yeah. on the Yeah, so between the also. eggs and all the vegetables, it's a great diet. Wow, uh -huh. you know? that is great. It is, and it's fresh. Mm -hmm. So it's And great. you also have a little bit of an, a garden inspired by African cooking? Yes, we mm -hmm. have a fellow now living with us from uh, uh, Ghana who helps me with my dad, and we, he's part of our family. My dad calls him part of his family mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And um, he wanted to garden too when he saw my brother, so he said, "Okay, if you want to pick up all the trash out back, you can you can try there." Mm -hmm. So we did. And he chopped down brush and everything, and he's growing uh, okra and uh, lots of vegetables and things that they they eat in Africa because mm -hmm. they eat off the land in Africa. Uh -huh. They just open the door and they start cutting. Wow. Wow. <laughs> he's in the rainforest. Okay. He's from the uh -huh. rainforest. Well, that's a great uh, new experience, I imagine, for your dad as well as for we the rest of you. We are getting a big kick out of what he cooks and yeah. he, he gets a kick out of what we cook. We have a lot of fun teasing each other. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Um, I see we only have a few more minutes and I know you had two suggestions for uh, what is most important in gardening yes. that you wanted to share? Yeah, if, if gardening is, uh, the best thing is you've got to start with some good soil. And if you have lousy soil, which a lot of places do because they mm -hmm. take the yeah. good soil off before they put the house in and they only give you a little bit left. Um, you can, at McIntyre's or any place you can get composted soil and uh, they'll bring a whole truck load. It's not that expensive and then you start off right. Yeah. And then the second thing is whether you're in a really sunny spot or a really shady spot or in between. Because yeah. that tells you what plants are going to do well. Uh -huh. No uh -huh. sense in trying to take something that hates the sun and put it in the shade or you know, other way around. It's mm -hmm. just, it'll live but it won't, it won't flourish. Mm -hmm. And one other thing, be patient. The first year they sleep, the second year they creep, the third year <laughs> they leap. Wow. 
wow, you know, <laughs> that's great garden advice. Advice I can see how that's true in my own garden already. But I, I'm also noticing, you know, it's interesting kind of uh, uh, comparison analogy for uh, life, right? And taking that's care right. of little ones and, and being and patient. People at all ages. The most patient people, I think, get the most reward. That's important, right? Yes. The importance of patience. It and, is. Um, and love and, and patience are very important. Also. Yeah, well, that's great ending advice because you clearly have loved so well your gardens around here. They are truly thriving and beautiful. Uh, and they're in saying their thank yous to you. And your father is really, he answered the door today with yes. a smile on his face. Yes. So things are growing well in, uh -huh. in your home. And yeah. uh, I know that's thanks to you and the special touch you have put on that. And last question, um, what would you say is a prescription? prescription for having a, a good life at any age at yes. any age what, what do you think I think a lot a lot of happiness comes from always looking ahead and preparing yourself for all kinds of things that may happen mm -hmm. so that you're not caught off guard so mm -hmm. preparation is important for your mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. even when you're old you want to prepare mm -hmm. and um, I think that you can't let other people sway you into what they think is important. You have to decide yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you're happy hanging up with clothes, you should not be ashamed of that. Mm -hmm. Like if someone's telling about all the trips they did and you're saying, I had fun just hanging up my clothes today. Ah, uh -huh. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Be yourself. That's right. The be more yourself, you can be yeah. happy with yourself, the happier you'll be with the world. Wow. Okay. That's a great ending. Really beautiful summary <laughs> statement. Thank you so much, Betty. I'm sorry we're out of time. There, I know there's so much more you could say, but I, that was certainly uh, bountiful in what you shared in that uh, short time together. So thank you so much. You're again. welcome. Hi, I'm Cheryl Peralt, host of the program Meet Your Neighbor on HCAM TV. This show introduces you to Hopkinton residents, the many interesting people who are our neighbors, and we invite them to share stories, experiences, insights, and observations from their lives. We'd like to hear who you think should be interviewed on our program. So if you know someone that Hopkinton should get to know more about, please email me and stay tuned for more episodes of Meet Your Neighbor on HCAM TV.